In this video, I am going to deliver on my promise to develop a superweapon against the social constructionists' characterization of science. To do this, I begin with a naturalistic, pragmatic approach to the philosophy of science, in which I constrain the limits of epistemic and ontic inquiry with scientific methodology. Put simply, my starting point is the claim that the only things whose existence were justified in positing, and the only things that count as knowledge, issue, at least to some degree, from the contents of our best empirical theories. I understand such theories to have been developed via scientific methodology, which, rather than being characterized via some discrete recipe, is understood here as adherence to certain functional standards. Those standards, which I have named the Big Four Operational Criteria, or just Big Four for short, are predictive accuracy and precision, explanatory efficiency, optimal flexibility, and rational coherence. These in turn are justified by the desirability of such properties as the applicability of those models to situations in which we hope to exercise decision-making power, the efficient organization of knowledge within those models, the accountability of those models to our senses, and the internal consistency of those models. But this presents an apparent dilemma. How can I naturalize my philosophical approach to science if it's founded upon normative, value-laden criteria? Values, we are constantly reminded, aren't natural, so a science which is founded upon value-laden criteria cannot be regarded as natural. Well, that's what we'll be addressing in this video. By its end, we will conclude that science is, at its core, in fact a natural process and not a social one, and the paradigm that we will be applying to arrive at this result is what I have called the naturalist nuke. According to the political scientist, Christy Winters, the standards for what constitutes science are the normative products of authoritative consensus and social negotiation, and so science is, in her words, absolutely a social construct. Indeed, she and others like her will no doubt look upon the Big Four as just another expression of socially constructed normative values. But look deeper. I submit to the viewer that the difference between the models generated every day by the average Joe and the models generated by scientists is fundamentally a matter of degree and not of typology. That the models generated by scientists are distinct from the models generated by common folk, their folk theories, only in that scientific theories do a better job of adhering to the Big Four operational criteria. When people navigate the world, they do so based on the manner in which they've modeled their environments, regardless of whether their occupation is as janitors, bus drivers, or researchers at universities. Scientific professions simply entail a more rigorous, more systematized application of those techniques which we all use to navigate the world. True enough, the models that the average Joe develops will tend to fail far more frequently than those created by professionals with years of scientific training, but the reasons for this fundamentally seem to issue from the non-rigorous systematization of beliefs by the general public, rather than from some special methodological distinction that presents a hard and unambiguous barrier between folk theories and scientific theories. Contrary to common belief, there is actually no such thing as the scientific method. There is no special recipe or checklist that one adheres to in order to do science. There are only the criteria stipulated by the Big Four, and even these are ultimately just idealizations. The Big Four cannot, after all, ever be perfectly satisfied, not even by our most successful scientific models, because as fallible creatures who aren't omniscient, we're simply not able to create models that predict every last detail of a phenomenon with perfect accuracy and precision. There are limitations inherent to our observations and our measurements. Errors and uncertainties will always show up to some degree, and this is something that those engaged in empirical inquiry just have to live with. To the extent that one is engaged in such inquiry then, that is, to the extent that one is developing and testing Big Four compliant models, one is engaged in science, albeit to varying degrees. So what then? Does this mean that everyone is a scientist? Well, in a very broad sense, yes. We are all engaged in the business of generating models that organize our sense data, and we all draw inferential relations between each datum with the aim of improving our ability to navigate the world. Whether that navigation involves the literal act of ascertaining one's own position and following some route, or the more general activities associated with functioning in the world and exercising decision-making power with tangible consequences, both the specialist and the layperson seem to be engaged in fundamentally the same activity.
the astronomer in orbit who calibrates a global positioning satellite, differs from the nomad who reads the stars to find her way through the desert only in terms of the exactitude of their activities. Ditto for the neurosurgeon who separates conjoined twins without killing either of them, versus the Russian babushka who eases her grandchildren's fevers with an ancient family recipe consisting of the leaves of Bregenia crassifolia. Ditto for the physicist, who cracks the secrets of the supercritical mass of a fissile isotope to develop the most destructive weapon in human history, versus the prison inmate, who learned from experience that toothbrushes make for more effective shivs than do sporks because of the differences in the plastic's flexural strengths, a property which she'll probably know by the name bendiness. The point is that there is continuity between the models developed by people in lab coats and the models developed by everybody else. Obviously, the differences in quality between folk theories and scientific theories are significant. I do not mean to suggest that they are equal. My point is that these differences are fundamentally a matter of the extent to which the models are governed by the Big Four, with professional scientific models exhibiting markedly superior accuracy, precision, efficiency, flexibility, and coherence. Despite all of this, there will still be some who insist that science can refer only to those activities undertaken by trained professionals, and that the models developed by the Hoi Poloi can never rise to the level of science in the absence of some credentialing authority. Such people understand science in purely institutional rather than methodological terms, and so will be inclined to view science as a social construct regardless of anything that I say. This kind of person will understand the barrier between science and non-science to be the presence or absence of a credential. For my own part, I evaluate the quality of a model based on the extent to which it adheres to the Big Four, regardless of the professional background of the person developing it. I'll have much more to say about the institutional and credentialing aspects of scientific practice in the next video, but for the time being, let us proceed with the characterization of science that is cast in purely methodological terms, without reference to those institutions which I take to be only incidental, rather than fundamental, to science. With this broad understanding of science as the development and testing of models governed by the Big Four, it becomes possible to situate the models developed and tested by both ordinary Joes and professional researchers along the same spectrum. Where a model lands on the spectrum depends on the extent to which it adheres to the Big Four operational criteria. On the far right, we can place those activities associated with the development and testing of our most successful models, such as quantum field theory, whose predictions have been verified up to an exactitude of 11 decimal places. At some point to the left of that, we can place the stereotyping and generalizing activities associated with the development of folk theories. Further to the left, we can place those activities associated with the most basic organization of sense data into testable models. Remember that when your senses are bombarded with sense data, your mental faculties are not just passively absorbing sights, sounds, and smells. Your mind is actively engaged in the organization of that data into models that you use to navigate the world. When I walk through a forest, I'm not bombarded with disorganized bundles of sensations. I don't stumble haphazardly through a kaleidoscopic cocktail of greens and browns and grays. I see rocks, I see squirrels, I see trees. My mind is taking that sense data, processing it, and outputting a map, a model of the world that I experience, and the properties of that model, at least when my faculties are functioning properly, are such that I'm able to competently navigate the world. And that model is constantly being updated. As I move through the forest and experience new sensations, my model responds to the changes in information and influences my behavior accordingly. The organization of these various types of models in the fashion displayed here deserves some elaboration. First, the basic mental models that we generate are themselves so specific to the environmental stimuli that we experience at a given time as to be highly limited in the extent to which they may be generalized. When I'm standing in a clearing in the forest, my basic mental model of my surroundings is applicable only to that specific clearing at that specific moment in time. This basic model is not a generalization of all the clearings in all the forests of the world, but rather functions as a map of the particular clearing that I'm standing in. If I experience enough clearings and enough forests, I might intuitively generalize certain features of those clearings within a folk theory that roughly describes all the clearings in the world. 
a more refined version of that folk theoretical model, of the sort that geographers and ecologists might perhaps generate, would refine the folk theory's rough generalizations so as to be able to predict and explain many different properties of clearings with a degree of accuracy, precision, efficiency, flexibility, and internal consistency that the more basic mental and folk theories wouldn't be able to match. The main point being illustrated here is that there is continuity between the basic mental models that we use to navigate a particular environment or circumstance, our rough generalization of these models in ways that allow us to predict and explain broad features of similar environments and circumstances not yet encountered, and the refined versions of such generalized models which folks in lab coats spend their careers developing and testing. Particularly important to understand is that even at the most basic level, all of these models adhere, at least to some degree, to the big four operational criteria, and that there can be serious repercussions when they fail. For example, there are important consequences associated with the predictions made by my model when I hear the menacing rattling and hissing of a nearby snake. Maybe I don't see the snake, but I can certainly hear it, and now I have an important decision to make. If I can't use my model generated from the sense data available to me in order to predict, with at least some baseline level of accuracy and precision, where it is that I'd most likely step into the path of the snake, versus where it would be safer to walk, then I might be faced with some significant consequences that could have a deleterious impact on my survival. If my model doesn't allow me to recognize the sounds of the snake in a timely fashion because my ability to process the information has been bogged down by inefficiencies and redundancies in my picture of the world, then I might be faced with some significant consequences that could have a deleterious impact on my survival. If my model is unresponsive to evidence, either because it dismisses the sounds of the snake as illusory, or because it recontextualizes that sense data as the sounds of something more benign, like perhaps those of water flowing gently in a nearby stream, then I might unwittingly travel towards the source of the sound, and end up experiencing significant consequences that could have a deleterious impact on my survival. And finally, if my model isn't internally consistent, for instance, if I simultaneously register that the snake is to my left and that the snake is to my right, and I have to choose between those two directions when I decide to move out of the snake's way, then my ability to judge the correct course of action may be compromised, and I might be faced with some significant consequences that could have a deleterious impact on my survival. So even with these simple models that we use in our day-to-day -day lives without ever really thinking about them, the big four are still in play. These basic models form the basis of the more advanced inferential webs of belief that we weave when forming the more complex folk and scientific theories that are further along the spectrum. Now here is the million dollar question. Who taught us to create models with these properties? Who socialized us into valuing predictive accuracy and precision, explanatory efficiency, optimal flexibility, and rational coherence? What society was responsible for constructing these values? Of course, these questions are malformed. They make an assumption about the nature of these values that, as should be abundantly clear by now, isn't justified. So let's ask the more general question. Where do these values come from? I have alluded in a previous video to radical implications of my philosophical program, and it is here that they will at last find expression. To the question of the origins of the pragmatic, normative values which motivate the features of scientific models, I'm going to answer with another question. Are human beings the only organisms that create models governed by the big four operational criteria? The answer to that question is what detonates the naturalist nuke. Science, I submit to you is much, much older than social constructionists realize. The activity of generating and testing models which adhere to the big four operational criteria is one that has been put into practice for far longer than any society that has ever existed. It is a practice that is older than the oldest languages, more ancient than the most ancient institutions. It is something that predates the existence of societies, and thereby social constructs, by billions of years. Science is not an invention of society. Science is an evolved cognitive process.
The naturalist nuke proceeds with the understanding that the knowledge-gaining mechanisms responsible for the development of Big Four-compliant models are not unique to human beings. And not only are we not the only ones modeling our environments, but the manner in which we develop our models is the way that it is because of the manner in which other organisms have developed, and indeed continue to develop, their models of the world. The knowledge-gaining mechanisms responsible for this type of cognitive process evolved from those of our non-human predecessors. The point of view associated with this stance and others like it is called evolutionary epistemology. According to the contents of our best empirical theories, the electrochemical processes that are intrinsic to all living organisms serve as the biophysical substrates for the receipt, storage, processing, and response to information about the external environment. Simply put, all living organisms detect environmental stimuli and respond accordingly, and these activities are fundamentally mediated by biophysical processes. How exactly this mediation takes place is a matter of active research in the emerging field of cognitive biology and its cousin evolutionary neuroscience, and the findings of those fields are the active points of discussion among philosophers of mind, or at least among those philosophers who aren't stuck to their armchairs. The following features of those fields of study are critical to the apparatus of the naturalist nuke. First, that all living organisms process information about their external environment and respond accordingly. Second, that these processes are continuous over the course of evolutionary history. What cognitive processes are used by human beings today exist because the biological substrates that enable them have evolved from simple, single-celled prototypes that were engaged in fundamentally the same kinds of tasks, albeit via far less complex modalities. Our capacity to model the external environment is greater than that of our single-celled cousins, but this difference is fundamentally owed to the degree of complexity of the underlying biophysical mechanisms, and not in terms of those mechanisms' typology. We all make use of the same basic underlying electrochemical processes, but some versions are more complex in their organization and constitution than others. And I'm not just talking about multicellular organisms with nervous systems, this applies to the entire biosphere. Consider the manner in which simple, single-celled organisms, like E. coli, engage with their environments. These organisms do not passively float around like motes of dust in the air. They receive sense data from their external environments and process that data, via the very rudimentary mechanisms at their disposal, in ways that involve the integration of information from multiple sensory channels. The results of these processes, which are mediated by the same types of electrochemical dynamics that underlie our own neural architecture, allow these unicellular organisms to make decisions under conditions of uncertainty, communicate and coordinate collective behavior, and even engage in brute force problem solving. Here's a video time lapse of slime mold, a unicellular organism that can be seen with the naked eye, solving a maze in order to reach some food. Slime mold doesn't have a nervous system, but what simple biophysical substrates it does have are engaged in the modeling of its external environment, which the organism subsequently responds to. And crucially, the types of models generated are constrained by the selective pressures that issue from a given environment. The tendency for the models made by organisms to adhere to certain functional properties is a consequence of their adaptation to these selective pressures. Well, that raises a question. What exactly are these functional properties adhered to by the models which govern the responses of all organisms to their environments? I'll give you a hint. When I described the scenario of my model of the forest with the hidden snake, I kept on reinforcing the relationship between that model's properties and its impact on my survival. That was deliberate. The functional properties that I'm alluding to are the big four operational criteria. They're the criterion that the models generated by living systems are applicable to the world in order to aid the organism in navigating it. They're the criterion that these models are efficient enough to allow for timely processing and response to changing circumstances. They're the criterion that the models are receptive to changing information, neither dismissing nor recontextualizing data in a manner that compromises the organism's fitness. They're the criterion that the models exhibit internal consistency in order to allow decision-making to take place. What I am claiming is that these properties, these big four operational criteria, were not invented by anyone. They are adaptations that constrain the types of cognitive processes that are used by all organisms to model their external environment.
The reason why we value the big four when generating our models is not because we were socialized to do so, but because natural selection made us value them. We could not have survived otherwise. Given two populations, one which models the world in a manner concordant with the big four and one which does not, the population whose models are more accurate, precise, efficient, optimally flexible, and internally consistent will, ceteris paribus, exhibit greater fitness, and will therefore be more likely to reproduce and pass on those genes which govern the development of those biophysical substrates underlying the development of big four compliant models. In other words, populations with cognitive substrates whose processes generate big four compliant models will have an adaptive advantage over populations whose cognitive substrates don't develop big four compliant models. Through the process of natural selection, the frequency with which cognitive substrates that do produce big four compliant models increases in subsequent generations. The social constructionists have situated science within discourses and institutions. In short, they understand science as having issued from particular social histories. But I played the Uno reverse card against them. I situated science, as well as all the various social histories of the world, within a common natural history that is governed by pragmatic demands which do not issue from any particular culture or history. Yes, axiology informs my methodology. But my axiology, insofar as the normative values that govern the criteria for what constitutes good science are concerned, is also naturalized. I haven't derived aught from is, but I have shown how the values which underpin good scientific practice don't issue from any particular society, and how the activity of developing and testing models is itself a product of natural history. Because this activity was not invented by any society then, but rather is a product of evolutionary history, science, at its core, is not a social construct. This is the naturalist nuke. To summarize, the core of my philosophical program is constituted by the Big Four operational criteria. These criteria also serve as the core of the naturalist nuke, which is a system of arguments, a paradigm about science, that situates it within our natural history as an activity which predates societies. And the nuke detonates via the identification of the values underlying the Big Four operational criteria with the selective pressures that have come to produce the cognitive substrates found throughout the biosphere, from that of the amoeba to that of the human being. As an aside, it should now be clear why I don't accept philosophy as a foundation for science. The ability to generate Big Four compliant models evolved first, and philosophy came much later. Once the cognitive capabilities to engage in philosophical inquiry evolved, the first philosophers and theologians used their models of the world as the basis for their subsequent metaphysical inquiries, whether they realized it or not. As I indicated in the previous video, I believe the relationship between science and philosophy to ideally be undertaken as a mutually beneficial partnership, wherein science develops models, philosophy refines the models, science tests the refined models, and philosophy reorganizes its epistemic and ontic contents in response to the improved models. Now, in the interest of time and focus, a comprehensive development of the mechanisms involved in the evolution of those cognitive processes that have, over the course of natural history, allowed organisms to model their environments will have to await a subsequent video, as will most of my rebuttals to possible objections. There will be those who object that the naturalist nuke is itself situated within a discourse, since I've used words to describe it, which by extension situates the contents of my entire argument within a social construct. There will be those who argue that my account of the Big Four as adaptations is merely a just-so story. There will be those who argue that improving one's models of the world in accordance with the Big Four won't necessarily lead to the improved fitness of a population, and might in fact lead to extinction. There will be those who argue that the Big Four are teleological, and that this is nonsensical within a naturalistic view because there are no intentional ends in nature. There will be those who insist that there are synthetic a priori categories which somehow undermine my entire thesis. There will be postcolonialists who argue that my characterization of fitness as related to the quality of models produced by a population makes me racist, perhaps even genocidal, with regard to those uncontacted tribes in the Amazon whose understanding of the world rivals that of our Paleolithic ancestors. And, of course, there will be the army of a priorists who will roll up in their mobile armchairs to wag their fingers at me for listening to Hume, Purse, and Quine instead of Plato, Aquinas, and Hegel.
All of these and more will have to be addressed in follow-up videos, but for the time being, I'd like to offer answers to three possible objections that seem particularly urgent, and thus unwise to leave for later. The first of these objections is that my definition of science, as any activity that generates or test models parameterized by the Big Four, is so broad and expansive as to encompass all possible things that organisms can do. If this charge is correct, then science is just a synonym for possible things that organisms can do, and my argument just amounts to the trivial observation that organisms did things prior to the existence of societies. In response to this objection, I'd counter that science is not all possible things that organisms can do, even though the development of models which satisfy the Big Four does seem to be a requirement for any organism's fruitful navigation of the world, something which in turn seems to be a requirement for most other activities. The fact that the development and testing of such models is a requisite for other activities does not imply that all activities that organisms engage in are identified with my characterization of science. It is possible for there to be activities that are required for life, like metabolizing sources of energy, without every other activity undertaken by living things to necessarily be identified with metabolism. In order to engage in any activity, like showering, fighting, or running, it is necessary for me to metabolize sources of energy, but that does not mean that showering, fighting, or running are synonymous with metabolizing energy sources. The same principle applies to the development of Big Four compliant models. There are plenty of activities which, despite relying on such models, are not themselves science. Literary criticism, legal defense, and selling used cars don't count as science because it is not the function of these activities to generate and test models governed by the Big Four. This response to the first critique doubles as my acknowledgement that there is more to life than the development of Big Four compliant models. In fact, I'll go even further and acknowledge here that the capacity to develop such models is only one of many contributors to fitness, albeit a very important one. The second objection that's likely to surface is that the naturalist nuke has missed its target. It is possible for the social constructionist to grant all of my points, from the manner in which I organize philosophy in relation to science, to the naturalization of the axiological underpinnings of the Big Four. Let us suppose that the social constructionist is feeling generous, and grants all of this without contention. They may even concede that science was not always a social construct. From primordial times to the evolution of human beings, it might well have been the case that the development of models was a natural process and not a social one, and we'll pretend here for the sake of argument that human beings are the only social species. But the generosity of the social constructionist ends here. The moment humans began to express their models in terms of language, they'll say, and the moment human beings began creating institutions to decide how resources would be allocated in pursuit of the testing and development of such models, science became a social construct. My response to this objection requires us to distinguish between three conceptually distinct elements of the scientific enterprise. The scientific activity, scientific discourse, and scientific institutions. The relationship between these three things might be visualized as three concentric cylinders of varying radii, with the central cylinder, the scientific activity, serving as the core. The middle cylinder represents scientific discourse, and the outermost one represents scientific institutions. We will hereafter refer to this picture as the three-cylinder defense. I'm going to argue that while the language used by scientists to communicate with one another and the institutions that they interact with in order to secure and make use of resources for science are indeed social constructs, the scientific activity itself, the core of science, is not a social construct. My justification for organizing these elements in this manner is rooted in history. The development of models adhering to the Big Four operational criteria preceded the existence of language, and the language used to communicate the contents of such models preceded the existence of institutions, including those responsible for allocating resources to scientists. In organizing science the activity, science the discourse, and science the institution in this manner, I mean to express the view that language and institutions are incidental to the scientific activity, and that the development and testing of Big Four compliant models is fundamental. It's the core of science. The three-cylinder defense is predicated upon the recognition that not all activities which are adjacent to science constitute the actual doing of science.
the bureaucrat in the Grant Foundation who puts a stamp of approval on a laboratory's petition for funds is not doing science. Such administrative activities, though of great importance to those who actually engage in the doing of science, are not themselves science, and so cannot serve as evidence that science is socially constructed. The communication of scientific knowledge through conferences, papers, and textbooks is likewise conceptually distinct from the actual doing of science, and thus also cannot qualify as evidence for the social construction of science. It is the core activity of generating and testing models, not the administrative pencil-pushing that sets the ethical and monetary limits of scientific investigation, nor the discursive practices used to share scientific information that fundamentally constitutes scientific practice, and that activity is natural. The three-cylinder defense articulates these distinctions in order to prevent equivocation between the socially constructed administrative and linguistic activities that scientists employ and the actual science that scientists do. To better illustrate the matter, let us consider, as a point of comparison, the eating of chicken. Eating chicken is not a social construct. Eating chicken is a natural activity because non-social animals do it too. Discussions about eating chicken are social constructs, because language is a social construct. An advertising agency for chicken restaurants is also a social construct, because it is a social institution that exists for the purpose of facilitating discourses about eating chicken, as well as providing resources that will further enable the eating of chicken. Now please notice, the act of eating chicken does not magically become a social construct merely because there exist socially constructed activities, like talking about eating chicken, and socially constructed institutions, like restaurants and advertising agencies that promote the eating of chicken. Even if you are an actor hired by an advertising agency to eat chicken in front of a camera while talking about how much you love to eat chicken, there's no good reason why engaging in these linguistic and institutional activities in conjunction with the eating of chicken transmogrifies the natural activity of eating chicken into a social construct. Now let's look again at science, understood here as those activities which generate and test models constrained by the Big Four. If the naturalist nuke is granted, then the development of such models is not a social construct. The development of these models is a natural activity, because non-social animals do it too. Discussions about the development of these models are social constructs because language is a social construct. A grant agency for science departments at universities is a social construct because it is a social institution that exists for the purpose of facilitating discussions about such models, as well as allocating resources that will further enable the development of these models. And these three categories, science the activity, science the discourse, and science the institution, are conceptually distinct. The bottom line is, the mere presence of social institutions and linguistic conventions does not automatically turn the natural activity of model development into a social construct. If anything can be turned into a social construct merely by talking about it, then there is no such thing as anything that isn't a social construct, and the entire argument becomes trivial. In summary, neither talking about science nor being part of an institution associated with science is necessary or sufficient to do science. Developing models that meet the Big Four operational criteria is. This does not mean that scientific discourse and institutions aren't extremely important to our societies. They absolutely are, and without them, the scientific activity would be far more limited in scope than it actually is. I am simply saying that science can exist in the absence of scientific discourse and institutions, but not the other way around. Still, social constructionists have scored a kind of victory, haven't they? They got me to admit that the language used by scientists and the institutions that they operate in are social constructs. But celebration is premature. I've never denied that language and institutions are social constructs, even where scientists are involved. The soft version of social constructionism that I mentioned in the introductory video already entails this kind of truism. It is the hard version of social constructionism, which posits that the model-developing activity itself is a product of social forces that receives the full brunt of the naturalist nuke. People who hold the view that scientific models inevitably reflect the social situation of whoever develops them, and who subsequently wish to impose their own socially situated perspectives onto the models tested and generated by science, do so at the expense of those operational criteria that have been imposed upon us by natural selection.
in attempting to contaminate the core of science by importing political values in a manner that shape the contents of our models, this kind of person engages in what I have elsewhere called the new Lysenkoism. Contaminating the core with politically motivated criteria runs the risk of developing models that are substandard in their compliance with the Big Four, which in turn endangers everybody because of how reliant we are on these models for survival. The naturalist nuke is a remedy to such ideology, expressing the development of scientific knowledge in terms that render the social constructionist powerless in her attempts to reshape the scientific activity. A comprehensive exploration of the nuke's various features will be the subject of future videos, but I hope that the basic sketch offered here is of sufficient quality to have left the viewer with a satisfactory understanding of how I view science. The third and final anticipated objection that I'll address in this video takes the form of an accusation. Namely, the accusation that I have equivocated between the scientific activity, the development of folk theories, and the basic cognitive processes that allow organisms to model the world. It will be argued that the development of Big Four compliant models is in some sense insufficient as a definition of science, that there exists a hard and fast way of distinguishing between these activities in such a manner that science becomes defined explicitly with reference to human beings and societies, perhaps via the insistence that intentionality, or language, or credentials are somehow essential features of science, and without which there can be no science. But such attempts to bake social constructionism into the definition of science simply will not do. I have justified each of the big four operational criteria in terms of the pragmatic features intrinsic to the development of successful models. The addition of other criteria will similarly require justification, or else they will be recognized as arbitrary additions that attempt to introduce hard distinctions where none in fact exist. Seriously, if you think that my definition of science as an activity involving the development and testing of Big Four compliant models is too broad, ask yourself, what criteria other than the Big Four must be satisfied in order for a model to be scientific? If it's intentionality, does that mean that artificial intelligence can't do science? If it's language, does that mean that a mute, illiterate person stranded on a desert island can't do science? If it's credentials, does that mean that laypersons can't do science? If it's some recipe called the scientific method, what aspects of this method, otherwise not specified by the Big Four operational criteria, are common to all scientific models? The bottom line is, our common sense intuitions regarding science, intelligence, and consciousness are becoming increasingly inadequate in light of ongoing developments in cognitive biology and machine learning. Future videos will need to be dedicated to the construction of those components of the naturalist nuke, which incorporate the influences that these scientific developments have had on my philosophy of mind, but for the time being, arguments from incredulity to the effect of, Herder, you think plants do science, will simply be dismissed. For the record, though, I do. Deal with it. In the next video, which will conclude this series, we'll turn our attention back to Christy Winters. We'll see how the naturalist nuke dispatches the strongest of her arguments as to why science is a social construct, but not before we have a couple of laughs at her expense when we see the quality of the remainder of her criticisms.